Hey guys! I know it's been quite a while since I've created a YouTube video. Uh, when I initially created this channel, my really purpose behind it was to help inspire young women to find self-love through fitness. Fitness changed my life. And with the confidence that it's instilled in me, it's helped me overcome any past pain. It's helped me face any adversities present day. And it just has made me feel whole and like I'm indestructible. And all of the attributes that I've learned through going to the gym has carried over into so many aspects of my life. But another reason that I created this channel was to speak about things that people are too ashamed to speak about and to address things that typically you don't openly address. And there's a huge movement behind it and I've always been part of it and it's ending the stigma based around mental health issues. Um, which I hold very dear to me. So today I'm going to share part of my story and that consists of a life story of someone who I hold very dear to my heart. Uh, she was an angel that walked this earth and even though some might think that she was set up for a disaster, I just wish that she would have realized just how much purpose her life had and how much value she added to this world. Uh, given up for adoption at six months old, my mother was the result of an affair. My grandmother was married, had kids, and uh, she had an affair and got pregnant. So at six months old, she was given an ultimatum by her husband. Uh, it's either as in the kids or her. And so my mother went up for adoption with her older sister, who was two at the time. And they bounced around in foster homes for about a year and a half until my mother turned two. And at that point, they were adopted into a well-respected family in the community. They were known as the Leahys and they owned a taxi cab company and were known for helping children in need. And they had adopted numerous children. They had a uh, son, a birth son, who was mentally challenged and his name was Merle. And Merle would march around the house, uh, sometimes butt naked, smear poop on the walls, chant and yell crazy things. Uh, but the majority of my mother's childhood consisted of her being locked in a bedroom, uh, her and her sister, and they were forced to urinate and defecate in a bucket. Uh, she continued to go to school until about grade five, at which point the teachers caught on to the fact that she was most likely being abused at home. And, uh, my mother's adopted mom pulled her out of school. It wasn't until about two years after that my mom turned 13 and uh, she finally decided to run away from home. The government put her in a group home at that point. Uh, the group home was filled with mostly colored people and uh, my mom being olive skinned you know would be jumped and beaten and called WAP or SPIC and you can imagine how that went for her. It wasn't until my mom was 16 that she first tried to commit suicide. She had slit her wrists and ended up being hospitalized for it. At that point, I believe depression really started to consume her and it became a reality in her mind that she didn't belong. In her early 20s is when she met my father and they fell in love and they decided to move to the other side of the country and they came out here to Vancouver 
and my dad would work away at sea. He worked on ships, so he'd be gone for months at a time. And my mom ended up getting pregnant with me and was lonely, and so she moved back home. And I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where my parents are from. And at six, six months old of my age, my mom moved back out here. Um, it wasn't long after that my parents separated. My dad would go to strip clubs and he's partying and doing his thing. So uh, I was about two and a half when my mom went on a date with a family friend and she was on the back of uh, his motorcycle and they're at a full stop at an intersection and a drunk driver plowed into them. My mom flew 20 feet into the air, fell smack on the ground and uh, she broke both of her legs and her back. She had to learn to walk again. She had to learn to bear her own weight. She had to wear a full body cast. I remember this thing, like she'd have to hang it up when she'd bathe and I'd see it hanging and it would just terrify me. Um, during that process, she was heavily medicated. I mean, she was in the hospital for God knows how long. Uh, the doctor, Dr. William Chan, over-medicated her and uh, was sexually assaulting her. She started having flashbacks of this after she had healed and she brought that up with my grandmother, my dad's mom. And my grandmother at that point said, you should see a hypnotist. Um, he'll record it and he'll walk you through it. And so that's what my mom did. And my mom decided to lay charges. It made the front page of the newspaper here in BC, um, the province, and eight other women came out and he ended up losing his license. Uh, I think I was six or seven when that finally came to an end. My mom really medicated herself. She was involved in a lot of gang activity. Uh, we had to grow up growing up. I told friends I had a pet lion in the basement because we had hydroponics and we had a light that'd go up and down the ceiling and cause vibrating sounds. And so I was never allowed in the basement. So I told all my friends at five years old that I had a pet lion in the basement and I wasn't allowed to go down there. Uh, my godfather was Jimmy Dosange, uh, who ended up getting murdered when I was seven years old um, by Bindi Joe Hall, another gang leader here in Vancouver in the 90s. So my mom was heavily involved in all that kind of stuff, but I had an amazing childhood and you know, <laughs> Mind you, obviously, money wasn't an issue at that point. I remember being like four years old and having the entire living room floor just filled with presents. My mom just wanted the best for me. And she did that. Like, my childhood was amazing. So I think she settled the case around I was six or seven years old and... That's when my mom really decided to cut ties. Obviously my godfather had passed away and we started fresh. Yeah, I moved around quite a bit when I was a kid and eight years old we moved into the, into the same house and I lived there for the longest I'd lived anywhere. And my mom really just wanted a stable life for me and she did her best to to provide that and there was a really big switch in her life and from the outside looking in you would think hey this is the happiest that Tamara's been you know she has it all together now like she's out of that life and she's let go of her past and she's settled things and now the dust has settled and she's happy and she's doing well for herself but you know behind closed doors my mom fought a lot of demons and for work my mom was a server so she worked at a family restaurant my entire life really um 
she was trained to have a poker face. She was trained to smile and laugh and have fun and make sure people are having fun and be warm and welcoming and goofy. And that's everything my mom was at school with anybody. Like as a kid, I was so embarrassed because everyone loved my mom. And <laughs> it like humiliate me, the things that she'd do. And everyone thought my mom was my sister and how hot she was. And as I got older, I was just like, stop it. Like, ugh. But I think I was actually the only one that really truly saw just how dark some of her days would be. And you know, some days she couldn't even get out of bed. Getting out of bed was an accomplishment. That's actually where fitness really started to play a role in my life because my mom turned to the gym and the gym was my mom's therapy. And so soon enough, she just became fixated on the gym and that was kind of her out. I don't really know what happened, but I just think there's a few things that happened at once and my mom was in a long-term relationship and that had come to an end. It was toxic, it was bad, but that had come to an end and uh, there's troubles at the restaurant, at her work and all her family and any of her best friends that she had had that Back from back east that had moved to Vancouver had kind of all gone back east and my mom had slowly lost contact with her friends and just really isolated herself and you know as a young teenager I didn't really notice these things but my mom was so isolated and all it was was work, home, gym if she had the energy, work, home, gym, that was it. I think everything had been settled down for so long and everything had been stable for so long and after years and years and years of struggle and instability, she finally had it together and I think there's an accumulation of things that just happened at once and it's kind of like a domino effect. and. My mom suffered from major depression, obviously, and she was going through all these things and became majorly depressed. And, you know, I was 14. So I had my 15th birthday on uh, March 22nd. It's 2000. Diamond wings and a pearl head. And at that point, I didn't realize the significance that this necklace would have in my life and the purpose that for my mom giving it to me. So spring break, just turned 15. And over the course of the next week, I didn't really realize all the things that were happening around me that, you know, a teenager doesn't pick up on. I remember my mom calling my grandma, well, my nan, and asking if she were to get hit by, if I were to get hit by a Mack truck tomorrow, do you promise you'll take care of Jazzy? And, you know, she was doing so much laundry and cleaning the house. And I mean, my mom was a clean freak anyways, but it's the second last night of spring break and I had fallen asleep on the couch and I woke up to a phone call from my boyfriend and he asked, he was at a wedding and he wanted to leave the wedding and he asked if uh, I was allowed to hang out for a bit. 
and it was late, it was probably nine or 10 o'clock. And I was like, sure, I'll ask my mom. So I got up, my mom's, I guess, in her bedroom, opened my mom's bedroom door and she's sitting on her bed, writing a letter, uh, crying. Mom, what's wrong? What's going on? She's like, you know, I'm just overwhelmed. Things at work are bad right now and just really stressed out, that's all. I'm like, hey, well, you know, Aaron asked if I can go to Timmy's with him. Am I allowed to go? And she's like, yeah, can you stop by McDonald's and get me a Big Mac? My mom loved Big Macs. So I, uh, yeah, went to Tim Hortons, grabbed my mom a Big Mac on the way home, got home and my mom was in the bathtub. I'm a single mom, only child, walked into the bathroom, I'm like, here you go. Left the change on the bathroom counter. And uh, said goodnight. The next morning, I'd wake up and that change would still be on the counter. My mom's bedroom door was closed. I woke up at like, initially I woke up at 9 in the morning and uh, fell back asleep. Finally, I woke up from a phone call and it's like noon. And I got out of bed. My mom's bedroom door is right across the hall from mine. And uh, there was a letter in front of her bedroom door. And my mom would collect these beautiful Christmas ornaments. And they were hand-painted baby ballerina angels, but their wings were like real feather. And at the top of this letter, there is a sleeping angel. And I just remember reading the first sentence. My dearest Jasmine, I'm sorry, but this pain has taken the best of me. And I just opened her door and ran. <laughs> ran as fast as I could and just collapsed. And I was on the phone. I was on the phone with my boyfriend. He had woken me up. I was on the phone the entire time. I cried so hard. He thought I was hysterically laughing at something. And I just screamed, my mom's dead. My mom's dead. Call the ambulance. I lived in a triplex, so I lived in a three-story apartment building and we were on the middle floor. And uh, she's my cousin now, she's my family friend, my everything. But this family lived above us. And I just ran upstairs. Before I even called the ambulance, I ran and just knocked on their door. And yeah sat in the hallway of the building and watched paramedics rush in and then quickly rush out. And police officers showed up and it was pretty much a crime scene at that point. So I remember two police officers just standing in my living room as I sat on the couch by myself. <laughs> they asked, do you have anyone that you want to call? So I called my cousin Dane. He came over. And then a social worker showed up in an undercover police car and it was Easter weekend coming up. So she brought me this huge bunny stuffed animal. It said, we have to bring you downtown with us. At that point, they didn't know whose custody I was in. And as I was leaving my house, the coroner showed up and she said, 
do you want to see your mum before we take her? I said, no, I don't want to see her. So I said, no, and we went downtown. Looking back on the week leading up to this, the signs were everywhere. <laughs> When I went back to my mom's house to pack up weeks after, we threw, we threw her a memorial, we threw her, we had a viewing and we had a memorial and I had to pack up the house and going into her bedroom, her laundry hamper was full. <laughs> All she was doing was laundry for the entire week leading up to this. She washed all my clothes, made sure I had everything I needed, cleaned the entire house. But the signs were everywhere. But my mom just isolated herself. And I was a 15-year-old clueless of what was going on around me. So I was pulled out of school. March 29th is when my mom passed away. I was pulled out of school for almost two months. And I had to plan a funeral. And I packed up my entire house and planned a funeral for my mom. I was heavily involved in the church. I went to church. And if it wasn't for everyone there, few individuals specifically, you know who you are, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So the church funded a couple U packs, big storage containers so I didn't have to sift through anything. The church came into my house, we packed my house together, threw them in these containers and they said, Jazz, when you're ready, you can sort through everything. You know, I had to pick up the phone at 15 years old and call people and say, you're invited to my mom's funeral. <laughs> people who had just seen her days before laughing and smiling in absolute disbelief. I remember going to the viewing and everyone being absolutely distraught. Actually, <laughs> I was the last one to show up. It was almost like walking to the altar. I had to walk down this aisle, all of our family and friends. And I remember walking up to the casket and it was the first time I had seen my mom since. And I remember just looking at her and almost laughing. <laughs> it's not my mom. It's not my mom. And that night, actually, I had a dream. <laughs> I had a dream that I was at my house and the entire house was empty. As if we had packed up and all there was was the couch. And I was sitting on the couch. All the lights in my house were on and 
down the hallway, I can see my mom walking towards me. And she's walking super slow and she's smiling at me, walking towards me. And I'm panicking. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. I'm like, you're dead, you're gone. You're not here anymore, just leave. And she walked right up to me and looked down at me as I'm sitting on the couch and said, Jasmine, I'm never gone. I'll always be with you no matter where you are. She's like, I love you. And she turned around as she walked away, she slowly disappeared. This is one of the few dreams that I've had of my mom like that <laughs> but I can honestly say that if she could take it back she would and that's truly the whole purpose of me making this video is don't isolate yourself talk about your feelings It's okay not to be okay. You're not expected to be happy all the time. You're not expected to be cheerful and fun loving and you don't always have to light up the room when you walk into it. It's okay to feel like this dark cloud follows you around. It's okay to not have reason for it. It's okay to not be okay. We all go through it. Sometimes it's circumstantial, you know, sometimes, you know, okay, this is what it is. This is why I feel that way. Sometimes you're clueless. It doesn't matter though. Don't isolate yourself. You're not in a battle alone. And I promise you that if you reach out, you'll see the hundreds of people that are right there with you, going through it with you. Just no matter what, if something's wrong, speak up and talk about it. Reach out to someone you trust. Reach out to someone you don't know. There's hotlines. There's counseling. I always found refuge in my, my friends. I had to go to grievance counseling when my mom passed away. <sighs> I hated it. And... I just found comfort in those that knew her and that could relate and that were at a loss with me. And it's that common ground of knowing you're not alone, but you won't know until you speak out. So my goal is to end the stigma based around mental illness. Depression doesn't consist of tears and emotional roller coasters, and there aren't obvious telltale signs in all situations. And if you're suffering from depression, just speak up. I've been there, we've all been there. Just know that this too shall pass. It might take a week, it might take a month. You're not gonna feel this way forever. And it probably won't be the last time you feel this way. <laughs> but there'll be a lot of good in between. And if you find your balance, you find your refuge, turning to your friends, turning to your family, turning to the gym, just know that you can push through it. But you have to be ready for battle. Fight. <laughs> Don't give in to these feelings. You want to break down and cry, break down and cry, but pick yourself up and talk about it. Anyways, 
If you made it this far, <laughs> thanks for watching. Tell me what does it look like in heaven? Is it peaceful? Is it free like they say? Does the sun shine bright forever? Have your fears and your pain gone?